and it's his good pleasure to give me the kingdom. And I'm having the time of my life. Okay? So I had the worst flight. I mean, it would have seemed like the flight from hell yesterday, but it's not like that. It's not, and I'm not undermining what Jeff said about the attack on the speakers. I just never feel that way because God works everything to the good. It's not about me. It's always about him and others. So you just seize the moment and you let God move in the midst of whatever. So you can't turn inward and take life personal. You got to take him personal, right? And you'll find everything will work out. Like the fellow I sat beside the whole way to St. Paul, I'd have never sat beside him because I would have never went to St. Paul, you know, Airport. So you, you think that way and you seize the moment and uh, God works all things together for the good. Right. So I uh, actually, Tim, I don't know where he is, but he's going to speak next. I need, I, I'm not a secret keeper. You know, sometimes Christians keep it a secret. They're a Christian. Ooh, don't do that. <laughs> Everybody ought to know just by just being around you. Really? You know? A dear lady back there, I heard her tell her son her back was hurt. And I said, no, just come here. We prayed. And she said, oh, my gosh. I said, well, that's the king. His name's Jesus. You just go after it because you believe it. And isn't that right? Isn't that how it happened? Feels good. She, she came back then and said, thank you. But Tim's out there. I'm wearing his pants. <laughs> You'll see him next service. Tim's about four foot <laughs> three. <laughs> I went in my hotel room. They said in the lobby, they said, I had shorts on. I got yesterday's shirt on. I haven't even taken a shower, folks. But you can see I'm having a good day, okay? Come on, it's just all right. And it'll be good to hug me. It's okay. God is bigger than all that stuff. But if you start living through natural reasoning, the way that seems right to a man, I'm telling you, it eats our lunch more than you realize, the way that seems right to a man. You just start thinking through natural wisdom. You say, well, yeah, and you give yourself permission to be less than what the gospel has allowed you to be. And a lot of it's your perspective. A lot of it's seeing through the right eye. So, so Tim said, I said, he said, what's your waist? And I told him, he said, well, that's my waist. And I said, well, I can get away with even a, an inch shorter or something. And I could, you know, probably do an inch bigger. It doesn't matter. I'll let my shirt out. And he said, well, yeah, but he's short. So they were like, well, yeah, right. His pants will be up to here. And I said, well, and he does wear them a little long. And, and, but I took him in my hotel room. This is exactly what I did. I held him up. I said, Lord Jesus, you can do anything if you can heal the sick. I'm serious. I said, you can make these pants fit. It's just simple. So I put them on. Now, come on. I'm keeping these pants. They... <laughs> Yay for Jesus, right? <laughs> so we're going to have a good time. I got pants. I got the Holy Ghost. and <laughs> It's just good. So it's all about relationship with him. I, I sincerely have, have been blessed with joy in my life. It's unspeakable. That, see, I'm like an emotional roller coaster, but it's in God. It's not, it's not in a bad way. Like right now, I could just cry my eyes out. Because for 13 years, I've known joy that doesn't leave me. I, I have peace. I don't even understand stress, strife, anger, frustration. You can't talk me into it. Jesus bought me out of it. And it's just the way it is. It's, it's so fun to live free. Because... <laughs> We sing the songs, you know, and we think, well, we're free from sin and we're free from hell and eternal damnation. No, I'm free from me. I'm in the Christ and the Christ is in me. Hey, come on. This thing is bigger than we've allowed it to be. And we sing songs like, Jesus, you're my everything, you know. And it's right. It's good stuff. And it's intimate. But I wonder if we understand what we're singing. Why would Jesus be my everything? I think we think because he's the only one that can meet all my needs. That's not what we're singing. See, it's not about Him meeting all our needs. He's my everything because only through Him do I understand why I'm alive, who I am, my destiny, my identity. See, God created me in His image. And it's all for His glory. He, he's put Himself in me, in you, so we can manifest who He is. Jesus is my everything because man didn't just sin in the garden. He took on the nature of God's enemy. And from the time you and I were born, we were taught and tutored by the enemy of God. And his mindset was our mindset. And our purpose and our created value was totally subverted from the beginning. Think about that. From the time you and I came through the womb of our mothers, we were trained up in the way that seems right to a man. 
Jesus is my everything because He's brought me back to original value. He's brought me back to the reason that I live. God allowed me to wake up this morning to have one more day to express who He is, to manifest His love and His glory. I'm created in His image. His image is love. It's not that He has a head, two arms, and two legs. Come on. The image of God is who He is. He's love. It's not just on the weekends. That's what He is. He's love. And He created me and you and me in love to manifest love. That's why anger and strife and frustration and jealousy and bitterness and pride aren't normal. That's why they feel so yucky inside. They're perversions and twists of our created value. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, put off the old, put on the new. You say, what's this have to do with healing? Everything. It's so foundational. Because I see people... We, we can go to church our whole lives and be faithful in church and serve in ministries and have need and cry out to God based on our need and never have our nature changed, our perspective changed, never be healed on the inside, never have our soul just at rest. I'm telling you, I'm so at rest, but I'm not sleeping. I'm alive, awake, but I'm at peace. Do you understand? I don't understand stressed outs. I walked in my bedroom when I got saved. And I think a lot of Christians, I, I've been around a lot of people that would have tried to talk me out of what I was praying and said, well, now, you, you know, you're going too far with this. <laughs> I found in Matthew 17 that if I have faith, I'll say to the mountain and it'll move. Doesn't matter what the mountain is. And nothing shall be impossible for you, me. Oh, my gosh. I found that in Matthew 17 and it's red letters. That means Jesus spoke it and that means the Father spoke it through him and that means it's got to be true. So it's not for me to sit back and challenge it and question it and debate it and analyze it. It's for me to grow up into and manifest. So if my experience and my results aren't measuring up to Matthew 17, it's time to keep just seeking God, praying, growing in relationship, growing in love and growing up into him in all things to the full measure of the stature of... Christ. You know Christ isn't Jesus' last name. You know that, right? It's not Joseph and Mary Christ. <laughs> he didn't say that we grow up into to the fullness of the stature of Jesus. It's, it's Christ. We're the body of... That means we're the embodiment of the anointing of God. No wonder Satan is so freaked out and afraid to stop what he helped accomplish when he put him on the tree. Because we're God's choice. People, I'm looking at the will of God. Oh my gosh, I'm looking at God's choice. You're God's pleasure and desire. You're created in His image. And it's His good will and pleasure to give you the kingdom. He said, fear not, little flock. It's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Come on. That's a big deal. Amen. The answer's in my spirit. Man, I'm not lacking any good thing except what I fail to see and embrace by faith. Do you get what I'm saying? It's so foundational. So let me share some good news with you and I'll just pour out my heart. Is this okay that I'm just pouring out my heart like this? Okay. Because I thought I probably ought to just share how I live and come from where I'm. It's, see, it's real. I live this way every day. So I didn't put on like a jacket to come to this conference. I didn't put on my like conference speaker jacket. <laughs> There's no such thing. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> it's called living your life in Christ. Because if I share with you what's real in me and what I'm living every day, each seed produces after its own count, and there's a power of revelation in that seed to reproduce in the receiver of that seed again and again and again and again and again. Everywhere we go, I see people get free from condemnation, guilt, and shame. Free from identity crisis, insecurity, self-consciousness. That's a good day. <laughs> the only reason we've known those things is because of the fall of man. So if he's my everything and my identity's in Christ and the reason I exist is found in him, it would pay to, to camp there and continue to let my identity grow in who he is in me. We've always focused on who I am in him. But there's a flip side to it, who he is in me. You know, I'm in him and he's in me. Do you get that? So who he is in me is the peace giver, the healer, the deliverer. That's where the kingdom starts to flow. It doesn't just come into me, it comes out of me. Do you get it? 
And it's fun. I'm having the time of my life being a Christian. It's not something we, 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 we keep in a box. It's, not, it's for the world to see. And I'm going to cover that. I, I looked. I got... Man, you all bless me. Give me a bunch of sessions. I, I'm going to get up here and just pour my heart out on a couple other things and about being in the church. And, but today I want to focus on the righteous judgment of God, okay? Who's ever, who's ever done something now that you've been saved? You've done something after you were saved and you knew, you knew it was wrong. You knew you shouldn't have done it and you went on feeling bad about it for a couple of days. I want to be honest and see your hands real high. Okay, now look at now look around. Keep your hands up. Be, be, just, be, just be humble with me. Friend. Look around at the hands. Now let me be a big, a smiling brother. Okay, put your hands down. It's just pretty much everybody. But watch this. I'm going to talk straight to you, okay? Stay real smart. Don't you ever do that again. <laughs> okay, watch. There's a point. I'm not giving you permission to mess up. Why would you carry the identity of the mess up and not let the mercy of God supersede in the power of this gospel. We all say we believe, dominate our weakness and let the weak say I'm strong. Watch this. The fact that you feel bad about it is huge. In, for, in 2 Corinthians 7, it says godly sorrow leads us to repentance. There's a time you did those things in your life. You didn't even blink an eye. Now you care. You might have messed up, but guess what your heart is? Your heart's actually pure. Whoa. <laughs> People come to me for counsel and they're, they're just, they're so condemned. They're like, oh, I did this. No, I did that. I said, man, I'm so glad to see you have a pure heart. And they're like, what? Did you hear what I just did? I'm like, no, they're missing it. Your heart's pure. You care about your life. You care about the performance of your life. You care about the outflow of your life. Who's ever had a thought of yesterday, past life, you had a thought go through your mind and then you felt like you were still that person because you were thinking it. And then you struggled and thought, I thought I was free from that. Right? And then the church says, well, I guess that's still lingering in you. And then we enforce a former identity and tell the person they've still got issues when they have Christ. When the thought came through, who's ever had a thought come through of your past and it wouldn't go away and it came back over time, but it bothered you? Let me see your hands. If you're not careful, you'll let that start embracing your identity and becoming who you are. It's just suggestive. It's trying to say, this is still you. The fact that it bothers you tells you you've changed. So watch this. You, this is how you cast down every thought and imagination that rises itself against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God is you're born again. You're righteous. You're free from sin. You're one with the Father. Right? That's the knowledge of God. So you're walking through your life. You're just a Christian. It's great. And all of a sudden, a blast from the past goes, Meow. and you think and you go, oh, my God, I thought I was over that. You are. Lift your hands and rejoice. Ignore it. Don't even acknowledge the devil, the problem, the thought. Say, Father, I'm so glad you set me free. I'm so glad you've purified my heart and changed my life and snatched me out of darkness and delivered me and filled me with the glory of who you are. That's how a Christian is to live. My gosh. I was in a service. I never was addicted to pornography like people get all caught up. But I was exposed to it my whole life. So I had... Different experiences with pornography. Is it okay if I'm real and just be real with y'all? So I was, you know, I experienced certain things in pornography. And one day I had a mic in my hand, handheld, don't really like them. I think it all happened because I had a handheld in my, no. <laughs> I was holding the handheld and, and I was ready to do a service. The worship, who's ever been, I mean, the worship was just, it was spirit and truth. It was God was in the room. It was awesome. So there I am in this place and I got the mic and I'm ready to go up there and minister. And I'm like, yay, I'm just glad I'm here and I'm just the presence of God. All of a sudden, this pornography thing starts going through my head like I was freshly partaking of it. Why? How is that even possible? Presence of God, corporate anointing, atmosphere, heaven on earth. And here goes this, like a ticker tape, through my head. I got a mic in my hand. They call me Pastor Dan. I'm supposed to be anointed and preach the gospel. And I got junk going through my head. 
I'll tell you what, if you don't have a strong identity and you're not in touch with God and you don't live with a pure heart and you don't have confidence before God because your heart doesn't condemn you, you'll get swallowed up by that stuff. I'll have a mic in my hand, I'll turn and I'll start repenting for something that I didn't even conjure, something that's not even in my heart. I don't want to see that. The last thing I want is that image. But I got a situation that's going through my head. I don't want the image. I know that in my heart when I'm all alone before God, the last thing I want to see is what I'm seeing, but I'm seeing it. You say, well, you've got a lingering devil, brother. <laughs> I don't have no lingering devil. I'm free. The Holy Ghost is in me. I got the past coming to try to tell me who I still am, what I still want. Testing me, trying to grab a hold of me, trying to find an enticement place in me, a place for me to yield and, 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 and lose my identity. Do you know what I did? It's really fun. I had the mic in my hand. The worship was winding down. Who knows what I mean? Worship stuck in this place where the, the presence of God is just there. And you think if you talk too loud, you might run the Holy Ghost off. It's just holy. You know what I mean? It's like, shh. Oh. Well, I, I'm in warfare. I got junk going through my head. I don't want it in my head. I got to get up there. And I just thought, cast down every imagination, thought that rises itself against the knowledge of God. I'm going to bring it captive and hold it, bring it into obedience according to Christ. Father, I just thank you. You love me. You save me. You wash me. You purify. I started going way above the atmosphere. And I just had my own little worship service. It was so awesome. And I just started like, yeah. Honestly, folks, that was a trap from hell. Testing the strength versus weakness of my identity to get me to go backward instead of forward. Now watch this. Every time Satan does that to you and me, he takes a risk. That I'm going to stand in truth, be secure, and look to God and submit to God, therefore resist Him. It's not a two-step program. Submitting to God is resisting the devil, folks. Don't spend so much time dealing with the devil. He's been crushed and defeated. He's supposed to be under our feet. Don't even give him the time of day. If he gets in your way, you move him out. Serious, fancy. <laughs> if he gets in your way, you move him out. But don't focus on the devil. Your answer's in him. You stay in the Christ. Do you hear what I'm saying? And, 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 and you submit to God. And when you submit to God, you've resisted the devil and he'll flee. Every time he touches you, he's taking a risk that you'll stand in the word of God and come out of that situation with a greater revelation of who God is and who you are in him. And this voice will get fainter and fainter and have less influence and less power. See, honestly, you might not be able to hook up with me. You don't know me that well with this, but... Really, the enemy and that kind of stuff I just shared with you has absolutely no power in my life. He doesn't even do that to me anymore because I'll just preach the gospel and flip out. I'll just... <laughs> and I might even tell somebody else too. You know what I mean? If I'm driving in my truck and something like that would come through, I'd just have a fit right in my truck. I pound on my steering wheel. I don't know how it's not broke. I bang on it. Jesus! Ah! Because we're in warfare. I'm keeping my mind free and clean and embraced in the Christ. I'm not saying, I bind you, devil, I break your power, I submit my mind to the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus wash my mind. Because that's actually what we've been taught, but that's all problem conscious. What you, it's all problem conscious. It's truth that makes men free. What makes me free is you love me, you've delivered me, you saved me, God. I'm your favorite, you look on me and smile, I am your boy. Do you get it? See, when that jump's going through your head, he's the same. The gospel's the same. Jesus still loves me. I'm not thinking that stuff, nor do I want to. So you cast the imagination down with truth. You always replace a lie with truth. You get it? Why am I camping here so long? Because it's so imperative in the body of Christ, because a lot of these things stumble us and they make us feel unequipped for moving in the power and presence of God. A lot of these things try to discourage us individually from feeling equipped and qualified. And I'm telling you, you're both. You are equipped and qualified. Let me switch it. You're qualified and equipped. Every one of you here that's born again is qualified and equipped to move in healing. These signs follow those that believe. I'm learning it has very little to do with the sick person. I don't embrace a whole lot of stuff that could not allow healing to flow because the more I do that, the more it hinders my personal revelation. And I'll get on that a little more. And I'll open some, some cans probably here a little bit and there'll be question and answer times. And you can all pummel me with your questions. But I've seen countless people tell me they don't even believe. They don't even believe Jesus is real. He's Lord. They don't even believe He heals. 
You say, that's okay. Just hold still and let us pray. (laughs) Countless people. If I embrace a doctrine that says God can't move because they don't believe, I've just allowed their unbelief to put unbelief in me. The only reason I believe, it's not because of them, it's because of Him. I believe because of His finished work, and I happen to believe His love is greater than where they're at. I've seen people smoking and cursing in public getting healed. I've had people come to me and confess their sin and unforgiveness after being healed. If I embrace too many things, I got myself so complex that I can't even locate faith in my own heart to pray for the sick. And it turns into a work thing and I'm trying to get some secret magic method breakthrough or something. Here's the bottom line. The finished work of Jesus rules and reigns on the earth. (laughs) And I just appropriate that. (laughs) And I just manifest that. It's called love. When that lady's standing there smoking and she lights a cigarette off of the one she just finished, this is a true story. And her leg hasn't bent for 32 years because it's frozen from a car accident. So it's been totally straight for 32 years. And she's swearing in between her cigarette and you're praying for her. Who knows that the average Christian mentality says, boy, if she put out that cigarette, maybe the Holy Ghost could move. Well, you know what? If she'd clean up her language, maybe God could show up. We almost think God's some offended. (laughs) Come on, if he was like that, he'd never come near any of us. Come on. I happen to believe that mercy triumphs over judgment. I happen to believe the goodness of God leads men to repentance. I happen to believe that that lady doesn't even know any better. That life has ate her lunch like it ate our lunch. But now that I know the truth, I need to stand my ground and represent that truth to her. So truth can come and make her free in spite of her. Because it's not works anyway, is it? It's grace, isn't it grace? Yay. Sure makes things simple, doesn't it? (laughs) So you pray for her and after about eight times of praying, yep, eight times of praying. Wouldn't that unbelief? No, we're not asking God to heal her. We're saying, knee, you respond. You go back to your original value. Knee, you begin to flex and move. We speak to every muscle, every tig- ligament, every tendon, every tissue. You bend, you flex the way God created you from the beginning. Knee, you respond in Jesus' name. Who knows that sometimes it's like hitting a hard rock with a hammer. If the hammer's the word of God, the rock will break. You just keep hitting it. Serious. After about eight times, something happened in her knee and she went, oh my gosh. She's so funny. Talking, we're talking, she's swearing. Her friends, she threw in a few words. In fact, she threw in a few good words, if you know what I mean. (laughs) If you're categorizing them in levels of cursings. (laughs) They were up there on the chart. (laughs) And, And we're just laughing like, oh, they just don't know. And we're not thinking one minute that the Holy Spirit can't move. We're excited for Him to move. She was so funny. She lay her cigarette down. Every time we'd go to pray, she had enough understanding and background and religion to lay the cigarette down and get reverent while we prayed. (laughs) So as soon as we stopped praying, right back up. Language. So we're praying. Clean up. Clean up. We're praying. Now we're... Oh, they're done praying. (laughs) Isn't that funny? But they just don't know. No, we don't. We didn't know. Right. So you don't judge that. You don't get self-righteous. You don't try to change her and fix her and clean her up. You give her what cleaned you up. And his name is Jesus. And he happens to love her so much as much as he loves every one of us. He's not disappointed with her. He's not displeased with her. He wants to open her heart to truth. After about eight times, something happened in her knee. And she said, oh. Something happened. Something happened. Because you know how God is. He just does stuff. He's cool. We just had a lady Tuesday night had abscesses and a tooth ready to fall out. The abscesses disappeared while we were praying and the tooth tightened like the rest of her teeth in 20 seconds. It's just fun stuff. It's just cool. We just saw a tumor the week before. It was about a lemon size on her breast. It went away when she was prayed for. It's just that stuff should be normal kingdom function. See, we see them as miracles, and it's really everyday kingdom function. It's just what heaven calls normal. And I want to grow to the place where that's normal. Where I'm not like, oh my gosh. But where it's like, yeah. You get it? 
So this knee started to bend and crack, and she's like bending it. And the reason I'm using this example is because her life wasn't in position to be healed in most Christians' thinking. It's not about that. Jesus is in position for her to be healed. Whoa, come on, that was a mouthful right there. (laughs) Jesus is in position. And if I rightly discern that and see that, I can give her the truth that makes her free. Whoever read in Luke 10, whatever city you're in, heal the sick there. And then tell them, the kingdom's here. If you heal them first, they can't know nothing. Come on, this thing is simple. We've got ourselves so... The ten reasons why not, and twenty more reasons why maybe not. And and before we pray, we've already settled on five of those in our heart, but we still pray because it's the Christian rhetorical thing to do. But when nothing happens, we already don't expect it because of the five, seven reasons why probably not. Ah! I want to throw all that away. I want to believe nothing can stop the power of God except the failure for me to see that truth that wants to flow through me. Because I'm a doorway of power in that situation. God has created me for that very thing. And I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm actually a vessel that he wants to flow through vibrantly. And <laughs> You get it? Yay. Yeah, I'm feeling that right now. It feels good. <laughs> He's saying, yeah, Dan. <laughs> Easy here. <laughs> <laughs> my, no, my biggest concern always, I'm like, God, let me stay of sound mind, because if you touch me too much, I'm done. I wait to be a flake when I get to the bedroom. <laughs> Some of you know what I mean. But when I'm here, I need to make sense. I need to impart. I need to... But he does. He touches you. He's on me right now. I just feel the presence of God. Just, he likes what I'm saying. He really does, because he loves people. He loves people. We watched, to make a long story short, we watched that lady. This, was in a, this wasn't in a church setting, see. We watched that lady for the first time in 30 years bend her leg and start crying. And she put this leg behind it and went like that. And her neighbor is flipping out. And she said, well, I need to try something because it feels like I don't. It just... I thought, good posture. (laughs) Whatever city you're in, heal the sick. Sounds like our commission. It doesn't say, if they're a believer, if it's the will of God, if the time's right, if, if they're not cursing, if they're not smoking, if they're all lined up, if they check their resume, if they qualify, heal them. The goodness of God, church, turns men to repentance. It's His goodness. That's what we all need. Oh, my. Watch this. I'm not being being rude when I say this. If we, the church, struggle with His goodness, how are we going to give His goodness? You ought to feel what I'm feeling right now because, people, I'm here to cry out. If I, if I, if I took the flight from hell to get here to where heaven's moving <laughs> yesterday, it might be for this one thing. Let's receive the goodness of God so we can give the goodness of God. Let's not take life personal and think that God's here to meet all our needs. God has met my biggest need. He has brought me back to Him. I'm no longer separated from Him because He's taken away sin. My biggest need is answered. I wasn't One with God, and now I am. Gosh. I'm not here as a Christian to go to heaven. That's not my motive for being a Christian. Heaven's on the earth. I'm a Christian so I could get right with God and be one with God and manifest this kingdom and fulfill the reason He created me. Ever since I've been a little boy, we preach that Jesus is the way to heaven. He's the way back to the Father. Of course I have everlasting life through Him. The emphasis is not heaven. You know what we do when we preach the emphasis is heaven? We, we create a self-centered church. A needs-driven people. 
I'm not a Christian to go to heaven. I'm a Christian to be right with God. I'm a Christian to be a son and he can be my daddy and we have intimacy and fellowship and I can be in his presence daily. I'm not a Christian to go to heaven. Heaven's coming to me. You get it? Oh my gosh. It's, it's not about the great escape and one day you go on this old crooked, perverse, dark earth. I can't wait till Jesus comes back. If you have that perspective, you're being way deceived and you'll never touch the world around you. It's all about you waiting to run. No, it's all about you denying yourself, picking up your cross and following Jesus. No matter what the cost and laying down your life and fulfilling the reason you're on this planet. And the reason you're on this planet is to manifest Him. What a reason to live. It's really good. Come on, what I'm telling you is true. I'm not a Christian. Just to go to heaven. The kingdom of God is at hand. And if I live from that, I'll live from heaven's view toward earth. Do you know how many times we live from earth toward heaven? Catch this one. I'm just talking. I hope I'm covering some ground. The last time I did this with Randy and I said, oh, they gave me titles. I said, oh, my gosh. (laughs) And the hour was up so quick and I felt like I spun in the mud and didn't get anywhere. You know, And people were like, no, it was really good. And I'm like, okay. (laughs) Seriously, gosh, because I want to touch righteousness a little. Let me just. uh... Let me say it this way. Do you know how when we're told we have cancer, somebody in the church is told they have cancer. And they're going to die. Here's what we do inadvertently, because we lack. What I've been talking about for the last half hour, this intimacy, revelation, identity thing. Here's what we do, church, at large. Monitor me, follow me, bear witness in your heart and see if what I'm telling you bears witness. We predominantly, 90 some percent of the time, pray from the perspective of the problem to God. So we're trying to get a breakthrough. We slip into works. We're striving. We're trying to pray the right prayers. Come on, you can pray and pray. It's not about how you pray. It's the finished work of Jesus. It's what you believe. I've watched, I've watched cancer disappear and didn't say a word. Just had my hand in my pocket and just said the name of Jesus. Yay! Did you get it? We've just recently had diabetes destroyed here in a string. We've got several people. Two of them were on dialysis for their kidneys. Diabetes, his kidneys were trash. Jesus came and thumped their pancreases and caused them to work. And they don't have diabetes on our medicines and their kidneys are working. It's like six of them in the last several months. Diabetes. Who here has diabetes right now? Just stand to your feet right now. Just stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Everybody with diabetes, stand to your feet. <laughs> you feel that? This is powerful. I want somebody to just touch them because this isn't a me thing. It's a kingdom thing. It's a church thing. The body of Christ. Diabetes, we curse and break your power right now. In Jesus' name, we speak to every pancreas in this room right now and command you to function the way God called and created you to function from the beginning. We curse every dysfunction. We break off every infirmity, every affliction. Diabetes, you leave the bodies of these people now. I command in the authority of Jesus' name, every body to be healed, restored, and delivered in Jesus' name. Pancreas, you work right now in every person standing. Produce the right insulin. Blood sugar be regulated. Body be whole. Kidneys be restored and if there be anything lacking or hurt through the disease of diabetes, we believe right now for the creative power of God to flow in this place. In Jesus' name. Now, Father, when they check their blood sugar levels later today or whenever they do, we thank you they're in the normal zone. In the normal zone. Pancreases work in the name of Jesus. Pancreases work in the name of Jesus Christ. Work in Jesus' name. Pancreas's work and function the way God created. Speak life over every person in this place. People stand and lift your hands to heaven right now and just thank God for loving you. Thank God for loving you. Thank God. Put your hand right, right there, sir. Pancreas, you work right now in Jesus' name. I command you, body, be healed in the presence of Jesus. Be restored in Jesus' name. Yeah. Lift your hands, people, and just thank Him right now for loving you, making you whole. You'll be checking yourself. You can testify this week what's going on with your blood sugar readings. Just get personal right now. 
Just thank Him. Get real personal. Father, thanks for loving me. Thanks for healing me. Thanks for restoring my pancreas through the blood of Your Son. Thanks for giving Your Son for me so that I could be whole. You put in His body the mark of sin so the mark of sin and the fall of man could be removed from my flesh. I am the righteous judgment of God in Christ and I stand in Your presence whole in Jesus' name. Amen? Come on, give Him a shout. Jesus! Yeah! It's funny, I was sharing that testimony about diabetes and I got the impression that there was a whole lot of that going on. You see how many people stood out? It's just, it's just how God moves. It's good. Yeah, Whew, that's how I feel most of the time. <laughs> people say, how do you live like you do? I say, by grace, it's the Holy Spirit's fault. He loves me. My wife was in ICU with severe brain damage four years ago. And I was just like you see me now. And that's impossible in the flesh. If you'd have met me that afternoon, the story of my life wouldn't have been, oh my God, you won't believe what happened to Kimmy, you need to pray. And I'm not being crude when I say that. I'm not demeaning people that that's how we live. I don't see that. I don't think Jesus saw death when He went to the little girl that had died, Jairus' daughter. I think He saw life. I don't think He saw death when He went to Lazarus' tomb. He's the author and giver of life. All He sees is life. He's the answer. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's the way back to the Father. He's the answer, right? I don't believe Jesus was praying for people from the perspective of the problem. He was the answer. And we're the body of Christ. We get words of knowledge. I have a good buddy, and he gets words of knowledge in public. And people say, how do you know that? That's awesome. He says, oh, no, it gets way better. (laughs) No, that's just the beginning. It gets way better. Hold on. God just heals people. Isn't that fun? Oh, my gosh. So here's what I was saying when I said about the diabetes. It just popped up in me. We pray from the perspective of the problem and we cry out to God from what's wrong, from the standpoint of what's wrong. And that puts us in a position of striving. Who's ever felt like they were striving and struggling to receive from God? See, that's an automatic sign that we're outside of grace and our perspective isn't clear. See, I'm a son. I'm not striving. I'm in the father's house. OK, here's what I'm trying to say. You say, yeah, but then we got sickness. We got problems. I mean, come on. We pray. The only reason we pray, it's not because we're in need. It's not because we're in fear. Here's the deal. You get told you have cancer and you're going to die. We turn and pray from the perspective of a dying man and pray all the right stuff from the position of fear and desperation and self-consciousness and loving our own life. And then we wonder where the move of God is. We've been influenced and determined and identified by what's wrong instead of what's right. That's why the Bible says faith will say to the mountain, not cry out to God. Faith will say to the mountain because it's living in the perspective of God and from the perspective of God. And it sees who the mountain is and what the mountain is because of the promise. And it prays from the position of the promise to the problem. And the problem must bow because of promise. Does that make sense? So my wife's laying in ICU. The doctor calls me and says she has severe brain damage. So if you don't know the gospel and the gospel doesn't possess you and consume you and wash your brain, then you react like a mere man and you fret and you cry out for mercy and you do all the stuff we do that a lot of times doesn't seem to bring results. I'm just being real. Is it okay if I'm real? And we say all the right stuff. The gospel teaches you how not to fear. Because it's never about you. It's about him and his glory. See, bottom line is I can't lose. We're in the kingdom and we're in the Christ. I can't lose. You say, wonder if she'd have died. Still can't lose. But I'm not seeing her dying. I'm seeing her living. But you still can't lose. It's never about death. It's never about death. It's always about life. Come on. Yay. I'm never going to die. You're looking at a guy who's never, ever, 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 ever going to die. You say, yeah, oh, you'll have your day. You dismissed what I said. I'm never going to die. I'm forever with the Lord. Yay. It's never about death. It's always about life. So what do you do? You go in over your wife and you pray over her. And you speak life over her. And you command every affliction and infirmity to come off of her from the position of the promise. In authority. Because Jesus is Lord and He's Lord in me. And He's placed all things in subjection under our feet. That's Hebrews 2. And in saying all things 
in subjection under our feet. There's nothing that He has left that isn't in subjection under our feet. However, we don't yet see all things in subjection under our feet. Who knows I'm quoting Scripture? It says, but we see Jesus. Here's what happens, church. When we pray all the right stuff and don't see it bow, we take our eyes off of Jesus and get into works and try something else and try to pull something out of the hat. And we turn the name of Jesus into almost like abracadabra and we try to get the right prophetic connection and let's try this. And I've been in those scenes already. Jesus is teaching me different. So I go in there and I pray what I believe and see and she just lays there. Who knows, because of what I see and believe, God's moving. It's impossible for the kingdom not to invade the situation in my heart. That's what faith is right there. It's the evidence of things not seen. Where's the evidence come from? His word and His faithfulness and who He is and His love for me. His love for my wife. So I don't have to strive and struggle and sit there and kneel and pray and sweat. and uh, I speak over that mountain and command it to come out of my honey. An hour and a half later, she opened her eyes. Totally normal with no brain damage. You say, you say, Dan, that never happened to me. Well, it happened to me. So now you got to put up with me. Because, see, this is the deal. I could have handled that a whole lot of other ways, but the Gospels washed my brain. I could have said, God, you can't let this happen to my wife. How can this be? God, I see so many people healed. You've got to save my wife. It's not a works thing. God doesn't owe us. He already gave us His Son. He owed us nothing but to love, because God is love. And He told us to owe no man anything but to love. And He already gave us His Son. His Son is the I love you. So from the position and perspective of his son coming, who's my everything, I fight the good fight of faith. So it's not about God. God's not responsible. God didn't do this. God's not failing. God didn't leave us high and dry. He's actually on the throne. He's given me his promises, his word, which is yes and amen. And he's watching me and he says, what are you going to do, Dan? You're my boy. Now be like me. Go represent me. Go ahead. Go at it, boy. You get it? That's so cool. We say we're waiting on God. I think God's waiting on us to get it. I found the coolest scripture in Matthew 6, 22, Luke eleven thirty four. 34. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. And if the eye is single, not multiple choice, not optional. Yeah, that's the rule. <laughs> I like you, man. You are just on it. I'm telling you. <laughs> I just see God in you. I just bless the God in you that I see in you. I see hunger in you. I just see sincerity. Bless you. Yeah, I just pray God has His way and just fulfills every desire and dream He's ever given you. Amen. I feel real drawn to you. Bless you, sir. Man, can I just bless you? Do you mind? God, I ask you to bless him right now. God, I just thank you for the hunger, the sincerity, the revelation, the outpouring of your spirit. A man of God. A man of God. A man of God. Not just a man of the church, a man of the people, a man of God. A man that reveals the living Christ, the Son of God. Father, the absolute manifestation of heaven through this man's life, through his words, through his actions. I thank you for the increase, even in the outflowing of the kingdom, through his disposition, his nature, even his smile, even his stare. Lord God, I thank you that you consume him, possess him, and manifest your pleasure in Jesus' name. I bless him, God. And I thank you for bringing to pass every impression and everything that flowed through me when I looked him in the eye. I thank you for manifesting your kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Yay, God. I got about just about five minutes here, so I got to wrap this up. But if if I don't have a right perspective, if the eye of the eye is the lamp of the body. If it's single, if it's not multiple choice, if it sees single through the eye of truth, my whole body's flooded with light. Well, that would sure erase fear, worry, despair, devastation, depression. Sounds like if I'm seeing clear, I'm clear. If I'm seeing clear, light automatically floods me. So when my wife was in that situation, I didn't have to bite my lip and be okay and say, okay, now look, they call me Pastor Dan. I preach the gospel. I gotta handle this okay. That would be works in the flesh. You don't even think that way. You're in the Christ. You just respond in the gospel. You live by the Spirit. 
And those that live by the Spirit are sons of God. Isn't that cool? See, we can all be sons of God, but it's a difference to be manifesting sonship. We're all... Who knows that God loves everybody in this room? But it says if we keep His commandments, we'll be loved by God. And Jesus will love us and manifest Himself to us. So if I live by His Word, who knows theologically I can say to Max and Nina, God loves you, and I'd be absolutely right. There's a difference between that and them being loved by God. Come on, that's a difference. See, God doesn't just love me, I'm being loved by God. Did you get it? (laughs) I hope you get that. Because love never fails, and perfect love casts out all So when we pray from the perspective of fear, it reveals that we're not being moved by the love of God that was sent through Jesus Christ. See, faith doesn't, faith works through love. Fear is moved by need. The prayer of fear doesn't save the sick. The prayer of faith does, and faith works through love, and love casts out fear. So the more God conscious we come and the more in revela- or in relationship with God we become, the more that revelation of His love overtakes us and we live from the perspective of love. Am I making sense? Now I'm going to close with this thought and it's going to challenge your spirit, okay? And then this cool little guy and I'm wearing his pants will be next. And... <laughs> Stand up here, man. Right beside me. I'm wearing his pants. Look at this. <laughs> Yay for Jesus! <laughs> I love you, man. Thanks. Come on. That's too cool. I went in my hotel room. See, this is what I'm closing with. That's why I'm going there. Watch. I know, I know he's a little embarrassed, but it's okay. He's growing in God. I've been watching. He's growing up in God. <laughs> you heard, Randy. He's growing in God. I went in my hotel room. Seriously, this is where the rubber meets the road in your Christianity. You can sit in a conference like this all week long, get touched, inspired, convicted, cry, laugh, feel the presence of God. But this is a strong statement, but I believe it with all my heart. Until you seek Him in the secret place, until you get alone and acknowledge these things between you and Him and you get real with the Father, I don't believe until then the Father will be real with you in the sense of revelation and reality. Knowledge can puff you up. You think to know is to grow. Love edifies. You follow me? So I go in the bedroom or the hotel room and I close the door and I held the pants up. It's just me in there. So either I believe what I'm doing or I'm out of my mind. And I hold my pants up or his pants. I see. I claimed them, man. It says it says lend and 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 let people borrow with no expectation of return. And it's red letters in my Bible. Lend and don't expect back. And man, they feel good. I just like them. But I held him up and I said, Lord, you can do anything. I said, if you heal the sick, you can make these jeans fit. Seriously, that's what I said. And I said, and I appreciate it because, man, just thanks. And I put them on and I just shook my head and laughed. And I took off and I thought, I'm wearing Tim's pants. I had to get you up here to see whose pants I'm wearing. I mean, that's like Moses splitting the sea. Come on. (laughs) Takes God. But that's my closing point. You take these things. I never got on righteousness. They gave me a bunch of sessions. See, this is how I am. I just, and we go where we go. But you did get something. I know you, I'm not asking you to clap. I'm not asking you to clap. But you did get something. I can feel that in my spirit. But see, we need to get established and founded in who we've become and who he is in us and love and righteousness where condemnation is a thing of the past that I can't be condemned. He didn't send his son to condemn me, but through his son I'd be saved. There's no condemnation in Christ. It's never about condemnation. It's always about love. Condemnation will steal away the power of the gospel. It'll steal away your identity. Man, I'm loved by God. It's His good pleasure to give me the kingdom. Jesus says, don't worry. And the first thing we tend to do is worry. He says, don't fear. And the first reaction is fear. It means we need to grow in the relationship with Papa. You get it? So this is what I'm, I'm, I'm just exhorting you, admonishing you, whatever word you want to use. Please don't just get fed and fed and fed and not respond to God in a personal, intimate way. In this, Let me give you this example. And I'll be done before a quarter after. Like where it's just you and God alone. Just make this you and God alone. Father, I thank you. You love me. Man, you've given me every good and precious gift. You've washed me free from sin. And when you see me, you see me righteous in your sight. Spotless and sin free as if I've never eaten a tree. God, you call me son. God, you call me daughter. And I'm so glad you're my daddy. I receive your love. 
Lord God. See, a lot of Christians don't pray that way because I ask. They say, Lord, boy, I hope today goes better than yesterday. I hope my car runs a little better today. It's been bothering, you know, troubling, and I'm bothered you know, that I might have to get it fixed. And my boss has been a jerk, and I hope he's better today. And just let today go fast, God. I'm really kind of tired. And we call that prayer. Total self-conscious, self-consumed. And all Satan has to do is push a couple life buttons, if you know what I mean. And that's about how deep we go. So we're just a couple little adversity buttons away from a fallout. Boy, I think the God we worship is a whole lot bigger than that. I think our perspective needs to deepen. We get in the secret place and the Father who's in secret will will meet us there. And where's He going to reward us? In the open. Can we do something in closing? I usually don't do this, but can we just stand to our feet if you can? Let's lift our hands to heaven. Let's just receive His love. And I'm just going to ask God. It's just like a corporate prayer. I just have faith for this right now. I just saw this. Just an impartation of just God to draw every one of us into His presence where there's no reason you can't enter in. Some people feel like they're blocked from God's presence, so that's a lie from hell. You come boldly into the throne room of grace. Amen? Amen. Father, I just thank You right now. We lift our hands to You, our hearts to You. We trust You. We trust Your Word. And Father, my prayer is right now in my heart that it's not just about us. It's not about having a better day. It's not about You just meeting all our needs, but it's about knowing You. It's about knowing your love, your nature, your personality and who you are so that who you are comes alive in us and so that we would rightly demonstrate you in our lives. That every person here, Lord God, would be granted an impartation of a deeper revelation of the person of God in them. That they would rightly discern you, Lord God, by the power of the Holy Spirit and then rightly represent you within their sphere of influence. I pray that you release every one of us, Lord God, in a deeper place of revelation where the things of old would pass away and all things would become new. That your nature, your goodness, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness would dominate our lives. Lord, we lift our hands and surrender to You and say, come and consume us. Live in us and flow through us and manifest Your good pleasure. Father, thank You, thank You, thank You for being who You are in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Give Him a shout. Come on, just praise Him. Yeah! Thank You, God! Yeah! Thank You, Lord! Thank You, Lord! We love you. (laughs) Yes, Lord. Yes, God. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Man, you guys are dangerous. (laughs) See, we got a time thing going.